This video will cover part one of appendicular skeleton. As we go, we'll cover the following objective, list and describe the bones of the pectoral girdle and upper limbs. The pectoral girdle are the bones of the shoulder, the clavicle and scapula that attach the upper limb to the axial skeleton, the clavicle or collarbone is a medium-sized flat bone on the anterior of the shoulder. The sternal or medial end of the clavicle articulates with the manubrium, forming the sternoclavicular joint, the only joint between the axial and appendicular skeleton in the upper extremity. The acromial end or lateral end of the clavicle articulates with the scapula at the acromial process or acromion of the scapula forming the acromioclavicular joint. The conoid tubercle or coracoid tuberosity is a rough projection of bone on the inferior surface near the acromial end of the clavicle which attaches to a, lig a ligament called the coracoclavicular ligament, also known as the conoid ligament, connecting the scapula to the clavicle to help reinforce the acromial clavicular joint. The scapula, commonly known as the shoulder blade, is the large flat bone with a triangular body on the posterior of the shoulder. You can see the inferior angle, superior angle, and then at the lateral angle, here's the glenoid cavity. The glenoid cavity contains the glenoid fossa, a smooth surface that articulates with the head of the humerus to form the shoulder. The superior border connects between the lateral angle and the superior angle. And then the lateral border, also known as the axillary border, extends from the lateral angle to the inferior angle here and the medial border, also known as the vertebral border, extends from the inferior angle to the superior angle. And so we have a triangular shaped bone. On the anterior surface here, we see the subscapular fossa, the subscapular fossa is the origin for a muscle called the subscapularis muscle, one of the muscles that moves the humerus at the shoulder joint. Then on the posterior view, we can see there are two fossa, a supraspinous fossa and infraspinous fossa which are also the origins for muscles that move the shoulder joint, supraspinatus and infraspinatus. And the, the spine of the scapula is a ridge on the posterior of the body extending across from the medial border here out laterally And the enlarged end here of the scapular spine is called the acromion or the acromial process. This is a flat projection that articulates with the clavicle forming the AC joint, the acromial clavicular joint. Here we see the coracoid process, coracoid 
means shaped like a beak of a bird, like a crow's beak. The coracoid process projects anterior from the lateral angle and serves as the origin for a familiar muscle in the brachial region on the anterior known as the biceps brachii that has two heads. Biceps means two heads. Biceps brachii has a short and a long head and the short head has its origin here at the coracoid process. Here we see an illustration of the humerus with the large long bone in the brachial region. The head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity to form the shoulder joint. The anatomical neck is the border of the capsule of the shoulder joint. And so is a, a ridge surrounding the head and slightly narrower region surrounding the head, the anatomical neck. Then there's also a surgical neck. This is a region of the, the metaphysis where the diaphysis and epiphysis join. The surgical neck is a, where the epiphyseal line is located and is a location of uh, common fractures. And so that's where the name comes from, the surgical neck. It's a common place for the humerus to break. The greater tubercle is a rough projection of bone on the lateral and proximal side that serves as insertion for a variety of muscles. For example, the supraspinatus muscle that has its origin in the supraspinous fossa of the scapula inserts onto the greater tubercle. And here we see the lesser tubercle, another rough projection of bone. This one's medial to the greater tubercle and serves as the insertion for the subscapularis muscle that originates from the subscapular fossa of the scapula and inserts here onto the lesser tubercle. So these are examples of muscles that move the humerus at the shoulder known as rotator cuff muscles. The intertubercular groove or intertubercular sulcus is a groove, an indentation, a long indentation, a groove in between. The intertubercular groove is in between the greater and lesser tubercles. So that's where the name comes from, intertubercular groove. It's on the anterior surface of the humerus on the proximal end and serves as an insertion for muscles like pectoralis major, the familiar muscle on the mammary region. The deltoid tuberosity is a rough projection of bone on the lateral diaphysis and it's located just distal to the intertubercular groove and the deltoid tuberosity serves as an insertion. Deltoid tuberosity is the insertion for the deltoid muscle, the muscle that is the large triangular muscle that gives shape to the shoulder. The deltoid muscle also is a muscle that moves the humerus at the shoulder joint. There's a radial fossa, a depression on the lateral side. Here we see at the distal epiphysis of the humerus is a radial fossa 
on the lateral side. And here we see a coronoid fossa on the medial side. So on the anterior of the humerus at the distal end are two fossa, the radial fossa and coronoid fossa. The radial fossa will accommodate the head of the radius when the elbow is flexed. The coronoid fossa will accommodate the coronoid process of the ulna when the elbow is flexed. On the posterior of the humerus at the distal end, there's the olecranon fossa, and this accommodates the olecranon process of the ulna during extension of the elbow. The trochlea is an articular surface at the distal end of the humerus, and the trochlea articulates with the ulna, with the trochlear notch or semilunar notch of the ulna. And the trochlea has a grooved surface that contours tightly to the shape of the trochlear notch on the ulna to create a very stable joint at the elbow. And the capitulum is an articular surface on the lateral side of the distal epiphysis of the humerus, whereas the trochlea is further medial, the capitulum is a round, smooth articular surface on the lateral side that articulates with the head of the radius. And so a condyle is a smooth articular surface, and an epicondyle is a ridge of bone adjacent to the condyle. Here we see the medial epicondyle on the medial side and lateral epicondyle on the lateral side at the distal epiphysis. These are ridges of bone that are located just proximal to the articular surface of the joint. And they serve as origins for muscles. The tendons of muscles in the forearm attach to the lateral and medial epicondyles. We'll see most of the muscles on the anterior of the forearm have their origin from the medial epicondyle, and most of the muscles on the posterior of the forearm, posterior antebrachial region, have their origins from the lateral epicondyle. Here we see an illustration of the radius and the ulna. We can see they're held together by an interosseous membrane of dense connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue. So that allows a slight amount of mobility between the radius and ulna. And so it's not a freely mobile joint, but allows the radius to move across the ulna as we turn our forearm in the actions of pronation and supination, the radius rolls along the ulna. The head of the ulna is the distal epiphysis of the ulna. On the proximal end of the ulna, we see the trochlear notch. The trochlear notch fits tightly around the trochlea of the humerus to form the elbow joint. The olecranon process is the posterior of the trochlear notch. The <clears throat> The lecranon process serves as 
a point of insertion for the triceps, brachii, major muscles on the posterior of the brachial region that extend the elbow. On the anterior of the trochlear notch, there's a coronoid process. And this coronoid process is an insertion for a muscle that flexes the elbow, the, the brachialis muscle found deep to the biceps brachii, inserts onto the trochlear notch. There is a radial notch of the ulna. That radial notch of the ulna articulates with the head of the radius. So the radial notch of the ulna is found at the proximal end of the ulna, then at the distal end of the radius, there is an ulnar notch of the radius, which accommodates the head of the ulna. And so the head of the ulna is at the distal epiphysis, whereas the head of the radius is at the proximal epiphysis. Here we see the neck of the radius, the narrow region that's just distal to the head. And the radial tuberosity, or rough projection of bone, that serves as a point of insertion for the biceps brachii, that muscles on the anterior of the brachial region that flex the elbow joint. Here we see the bones of the wrist and hands. There are eight carpal bones organized in two rows, a proximal row and a distal row. You could use the mnemonic device, stop letting those people touch the cadaver's hands to remember the names in order through the proximal row from lateral to medial, scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform. In the distal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So here we see the scaphoid and lunate articulating with the radius on the lateral side then the triquetrum, articulating with the ulna, and then the pisiform. We don't really see the pisiform here in the posterior view because it's found anterior to the triquetrum in the proximal row. Then along the distal row, we have the trapezium, then the trapezoid, capitate, And the furthest medial articulating with the fifth digit is the hammy. Then the metacarpals are numbered one through five. 
from lateral to medial. In the phalanges are also numbered one through five. Remember the metacarpals and the phalanges are long bones, so they have expanded epiphyses and a narrow shaft of diaphysis, whereas the carpals are short bones, they're boxy shaped bones. Each digit has a proximal phalange, so there are proximal phalanges and there are distal phalanges in each digit. And the first digit only has distal and proximal. So the pollux only has two phalanges, whereas there's proximal middle and distal, proximal middle and distal for digits two through five. Here we see a, a radiograph, an x-ray of the hand where we can see the carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges, the way that they articulate the joints between them, the way they fit together in the context of the hand. What we're seeing here the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum. The pisiform is further on the anterior, so we can't see the pisiform with this posterior view. But here we can see the next row has the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. And then we have number one metacarpal, two, three, four, and five. And then the phalanges, this is proximal. And so that would be the first proximal phalange, and then here's the distal, whereas here we have middle, as well as distal and proximal for digits two through five. 